We are Alex Alonzo from Street TV, the man who's been covering the Nipsey, I mean the Eric Holder trial, the man who killed Nipsey Hussle, uh, let's not forget. And um, yeah, he's been in the courtroom and tell us about day, day six. Well, day six uh, started at 10 a.m. That would have been uh, Thursday, March 20, I'm sorry, Thursday, June 23rd. And the first witness for the prosecution was a gang cop named Gilberto Glaxio, G-L-A-X-I-O-A. -A. And he was a 17-year veteran of the LAPD. And he had a, at least five years experience of uh, being in the, I guess he said he patrolled the area for five years. But uh, they started off with putting a map of the rolling 60s turf mm -hmm. a, map, a map which i actually disagreed with the borders but uh you know they made the turf look really big bigger than what it was i guess the the disagreement i had was the north border but the borders didn't come up until cross-examination so when the prosecutor had the map up there there wasn't really much talk about the borders uh, they mentioned the clicks of the 60s which was front hood overhill brian hurst gutter kids and then they asked a little bit about what is snitching. And the cop said it's uh, telling on someone with the police in various ways from a 911 call to uh, a citizen talking to someone on the streets. And then the, the DA asked, um, is it, would you even consider a small child as a snitch? <laughs> and the cop, <laughs> the cop said, could be. Wow. Uh, but the, I think the point that the prosecutor was trying to get from the, from the gang cop was, that this idea of snitching applies both to gang members and non-gang members. And then that's when uh, we learned that he patrolled, he had just patrolled this area for five years. And he said that, um, they asked him what does paperwork mean? And he said it was an official document, like a police report or any sort of court document, like a transcript. And uh, how does paperwork relate to snitching? And he said, it just proves, it proves uh, someone that, it did that told on somebody it proves he said it could prove that someone snitched or didn't snitch it goes both ways mm -hmm. and um what else here he did mention that he had interactions with nipsey hustle over the years and he had interaction with eric holder over the years so according to this cop he knew both of them he was asked how many times do you think you encountered nipsey hustle he said 50 times and regarding Eric Holder, he said uh, no more than 10 times. And that was pretty much it on 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 direct by, a, by Prosecutor McKinney. I have a question. Yeah. I'm not sure if it came from that witness in particular, but is it true that they did not like Nipsey being there or his business being there? or You know, because there was, I guess, maybe... He brought a lot of uh, a lot of a uh, gang mentality, the gang presence in the area of. Oh yeah, the um, there was some testimony about the police wanting to shut down that strip mall because of gang activity and nuisance. And uh, let me just check right here if that came from him or if that came from another cop. But yes, that that testimony definitely came in. And I'm not sure if it came in under this cop, under cross-examination or direct, but uh, we'll we'll get back to that in a second. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, so the attorney Jansen did cross-examine the gang cop, and he asked about how old was Eric Holder when he first encountered him. He said he was a teenager. He believes the first time Eric, uh, yeah, he believes the first time he met Eric Holder, he was 17 years old. And um, he said basically that Eric Holder was a self-admitted role in 60s. Uh, the, the defense attorney asked him, how did you know he was a member of Roland 60s? Is it because of the tattoos? And he said yes, but he also admitted it to him as well. Mm -hmm. The defense attorney is the one that asked for the boundaries of the, of the, of the hood, of the, which was on that map. And he said it was 48th Street to the north, 74th to the south, Overhill to the west, and Western to the west. I mean, Western to the east. 
And on that map, there was a, a big M that was placed on the center for the uh, marathon store. Oh, and it and to answer your question, that's when it came up under cross-examination. Deputy Public Defender Jansen asked him, are you familiar with the LAPD in the city of LA trying to shut down that strip mall? And that's when that first came up. And the gang cop replied, yes, because it was a nuisance. Yes. And um, that was pretty much it. And then the de defense attorney went on to ask him about different crimes that can be considered gang related under under the gang enhancement rule and then there was an objection the attorneys had a sidebar and then the the attorneys came back and the questioning just went on to some other topics so i guess you know we, we didn't get to hear what the judge said but obviously uh, the judge did not want him to continue asking them questions about which crimes could be considered gang crimes according to the gang enhancement law hmm. So then he basically asked, um, based on your extensive experience with the Rolling 60s, is murder a crime they do? And he said, yes. And then he asked, is intimidating witnesses a crime? The gang cop said, it could happen. A, a couple cases in the 17 years, but it's very low. Um, so I, the attorney was trying to establish a pattern of criminal activity. And then they went on to the asking about symbols that the rolling 60s wear in terms of clothing seattle mariners hat white Sox hat new york yankees hat north carolina hat all of that came up and then the defense attorney decided to throw up some pictures of nipsey hustle throwing gang signs to show that like he was an active gang member mm. they showed pictures they showed old pictures of nipsey doing gang signs and more recent pictures of nipsey doing gang signs and the cop agreed that, yep, those are gang related signs. Um, and then he continued, actually the defense attorney cross-examined this gang cop longer than the prosecutor had him on direct examination. So there was a lot of talk about crime and then he went on to uh, um, snitching and he, he tried to get the cop to admit that isn't the snitching a serious offense? Um, and he eventually, he did concede it, but in a very, uh, you could tell he wasn't trying to to give the defense attorney the answers that he, he wanted, but the defense attorney was pretty pretty persistent on asking the questions in, um, you know, in a particular way to get a particular answer. Mm -hmm. So one, one question was, is if someone is accused of snitching, the burden, the burden. Oh no, wait up. Let me let me make sure, because there was there was cross there, there was recross examination. So um, after the defense attorney showed all those photos, um, then they talked about snitching, and and then the. Um, yeah, there was a lot of talk about snitching. They went back and forth on this. There was actually a lot of, there was some direct and cross. They were going back and forth about the snitching. I'm not really sure who won that battle, but at the end of the day, the defense attorney was just trying to establish that snitching is serious. I mean, right. they spent like 15, 20 minutes going back and forth about talking about snitching. And all the defense attorney wanted to establish was that is, is snitching a serious offense? Mm -hmm. And I believe he got that out of him. Right. And then, uh, let's see. A lot of the stuff that, um, oh, he, they also um, asked about Rimpaw with this uh, same gang cop. Let's see. Um, I believe prosecutor John McKinney on redirect asked, asked the gang cop, do you know Rimpaw? And he said, yes. They asked him, is he a rolling 60s crip? He said, yes. Um, and that was pretty much it. We all know that Rimpaw wasn't in court on that day. And the cop actually admitted to testifying on over 100 Roland 60s cases, which I thought was an, that's an incredible number of ca cases to have testified on. <laughs> For a moment, I thought that that could have been a mistake. To testify on 100 Roland 60s cases, 
Um, I'm not even aware if there's a, 160 cases in his five years as a rolling 60s expert, but okay. that's what he did. He admitted to testifying in over 100 rolling 60s crypt cases. And that pretty much sums up the gang cops testimony. Mm-hmm. And any questions on the gang cop? Not really. Some expert, though. <laughs> then after him, Detective Cedric Washington. I have him as witness number 17 based on my own my own um, counting. I, I don't believe I missed anyone. And we all know that Detective Cedric Washington was the lead homicide detective on this case, along with his partner, who testified a couple of days before. Mm-hmm. Uh, they, he, he provided his background and experience. Uh, I also learned, I didn't know this about him, in addition to his 27 years as an LAPD officer, he's also um, a, Marine, a Marine Corps veteran. So he's got military experience as well. Mm-hmm. Um, he also worked undercover as a gang member in, wow. in various different, um, you know, operations. Mm-hmm. And they even went into detail about, like, how do you pull that off? Well, first, he's, he's a black detective. Right. So he could definitely, you know, blend into any black community in L.A. Mm-hmm. But, but he testified as taking on an assumed identity along with a fake driver's license that they legitimately created from the DMV. So he has a fake birthday, a fake name, all on a official California driver's license, um, working as an undercover, as an associate of a gang. So they were just basically trying to establish that Detective Washington has been around a long time and has a lot of experience dealing with gangs as an uh, LAPD officer. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he talked about that there were two guns used, but they were never able to retrieve them. And that he he did search warrants at Eric Holder's residence in o, in um, in Long Beach, and also his cousin Harold's place, where they did not find any evidence, no guns, no ammunition. So um, that was that about the guns. Um, they also discussed Rimpaw, Evan McKenzie, and they showed the video to just for the detective to point out which guy was Rimpaw. And then he also testified that, you know, as of a few minutes ago, that he was still trying to find Rimpaw and that they're, you know, they're steadily working to find him so they can bring him into court and that there's a a bench warrant for his arrest. Mm -hmm. Um, So after they talked about Rimpaw, this is interesting. We didn't know this. Um, I'm not sure if this was in the grand jury transcript, but Detective Washington said that he had actually spoke to Rimpaw previously, before the trial, on at least four different occasions. Okay. And uh, Prosecutor McKinney asked him, did you talk to him after the incident? And Detective Washington replied, yes, at least four different times. And... The prosecutor asked, "Where did this occur?" And uh, it, it occurred kind of in the area, not too, you know, not too far from the incident. I'm not sure if they didn't say if it was his house, an apartment. And Detective Washington recorded one of the last conversations he had with Rimpaw, you know, pr- after the incident occurred. Prosecutor McKinney asked him, "Was Rimpaw cooperative at that time?" And he, he replied, yes, at that time he was cooperative. Hmm. And then he talked about um, getting him under a subpoena so he can come to court. And then, and then Detective Washington started to th- talk about how he was avoiding him recently. You know, hmm. as they got closer to trial day, it became more difficult for the detective to reach out to Rimpaw. Right. But he did establish that he had he had four encounters with Rimpaw, and apparently they were all, um, you know, they were all you know normal encounters. And um, let's see what else happened. So he just basically asked them, um, "Did you make great efforts to bring Rimpaw into court?" And he said yes. And um, 
they were using different investigators from the LA district attorney's office to try to track him down and get him served. And that was pretty much on Rimpaw. Mm-hmm. And they went and showed a few photos. Any questions on, um, on the Rimpaw information? Yeah, I guess they still haven't found him or no, no luck on him, huh? Well, we won't know if they found him until uh, Monday or Tuesday. Right. So, you know, maybe they found they could if they find him today or last night, we won't know. Right. Yeah. Until uh, until they uh, go back to court, unless they announce it, unless they announce it. Uh, they showed a few photographs during Detective Washington's testimony. Um, and let's see what else. Uh, did they show his tattoos, uh, Eric Holder's tattoos? They did, but not uh, not at this. Let me see. Not at I, actually. Did they show his tattoos? I believe they showed his tattoos when the gang cop was testifying. Yes. Did you want to talk a little bit about the tattoos? Yeah. Is there any tattoos that you could um you could remember to tell us? Yes. Um, they had photos of Eric Holder, close up photos of his chest, uh, or, you know, his whole torso, and they had a. <laughs> They had a picture, uh, and this is under the gang cop's testimony. The, there's a photo of the, the word 60s tattooed along his stomach. He also has a tattoo of Overhills, um, somewhere up in the chest area. Mm-hmm. Overhills is one of the, the sections of the Roman 60s. Right. He also has the Roman numeral 60 tattooed on his back arm or the tricep area where he has an L on the back of his left arm and an x on the back of his right arm so if you're standing behind him it would say 60s or 50 plus 10. Mm. so um and then he has a neighborhood tattoo an h tattoo and that's about it neighborhood city in terms of the gang tattoos those are the ones that they focused on, but you can clearly see he had he had a bunch more tattoos that they didn't talk about, and you would have to get that exhibit, and that would be under Exhibit sixty six, the pictures of Eric Holder's tattoos. Oh, he also had um the Rich Rolling tattoo, the double R, which mm-hmm. is they used a Rolls Royce logo for the Rich Rolling, mm-hmm. and he had Neighborhood Crip on his arm. All right, so... What does Rich Rolling mean? Is that a gang? No, nah, that's just a saying that the 60s been using since back in the day because of, um, you know, a lot of 60s had a reputation of balling, being like, you know, high rollers during that crack cocaine epidemic in the 1980s. So that Rich Rolling goes way back, you know, what, 30 years, mm-hmm. 30, 40 years. So that's all that means. And, you know, it's stuck, and, and they've been using it ever since. Oh, okay. You could be... You could still you could be a broke guy and yeah. still and still say Rich Rollin, yeah. but yeah, back in the eighties they used to say Rich Rollin because all those dudes was having money back then. Mm-hmm. They was Rich Rollin, <laughs> broke Rollin. Well, <laughs> yeah. there's no evidence that um, Eric Holder ever became one of those baller type guys. Yeah. All right, so um, back to Detective Washington. Um. He testified under direct. This was interesting because there was some objection to this by the defense, Mm -hmm. but the prosecutor wanted Detective Washington to opine on whether or not Eric Holder had a gun in his pocket when he first walked into the Master Burger. Now, the Master Burger footage, which which uh, no one had seen before, I don't believe this. This had never been this Master Burger footage had never been released before. So no one knew what to what this master burger footage shows, but it's in color, and it's about um it's a few minutes long, and it shows Eric Holder walking into the master burger without a shirt on, so it's it's pretty clear. But the prosecutor wanted Detective Washington to tend to opine on whether or not he had a gun on him at that time. Now, of course, the defense objected and said that's a speculation. They had a sidebar which was meaning, for those who don't understand, they had a sidebar out of the hearing of the jury. So, And and if you're in the audience, you can't hear it either. So that's when the two attorneys and the judge walk over to the side. There's a microphone there so the court reporter can type up that conversation. 
but the jury can't hear it and us in the audience can't hear it. Wow. And they, they do that because they don't want the jury to be biased by any conversations that they're having. So they had basically a, a, a debate about, <coughs> I, I'm, basically in a nutshell, the, the defense attorney told the judge, I don't, I'm not comfortable with the cop speculating whether or not he had a gun in his pocket and that that's based on speculation and you know witnesses should not allow to speculate prosecutor john mckinney i'm sure countered back during that sidebar saying my guy is a 27 year veteran of the lapd he's a former marine he's a he's a marine veteran he has the expertise to know when someone is armed or not you know so uh, McKinney won that argument out, and he was allowed to base you – know, he was allowed to to testify on whether or not he thought Eric Holder had a gun on him when he walked into the Master Burger. Mm-hmm. And if you want to guess what he said, what do you think he said? Uh, I'm not sure what he said. <laughs> he said that if you look at the right front pocket on that Master Burger video footage, you can see an impression <clears> – <throat> You can see an impression. They use the word impression and a bulge. And the defense attorney objected again. He said, you know, this is speculation. Mm. And the judge said, the judge said, um, you know, this is his opinion. So I'm going to let him testify, um, you know, that this is just his opinion. So basically, Detective Washington said, based on his opinion, the bulge was consistent to a gun, a medium-sized gun in his right front pocket. And that's pretty huge, you know, and we could talk about that um, in a moment. But uh, that was pretty much the, um, the main thing that came out of testimony under under direct with Detective Washington. And then, of course, uh, there was some cross-examination by the defense, basically trying to get Detective Washington to say that that no one wants to cooperate. Everyone is worried about, you know, their safety. Mm-hmm. And, uh, for example... There's a name that came up, Melody James. He said, isn't it true that Melody James does not want to be in court or did not want to cooperate? And he he suggested, yes, that's true. Um, he also asked him about Carrie Latham, Shermai Villanueva. Did they, were they reluctant? And he agreed, yes, they were reluctant. Um, and even Evan McKenzie, Rimpaw, who, who doesn't want to show in court. And he agreed that that they were reluctant, and um, that was pretty much it. Who's Melody James? Do you know? No, we don't know who Melody James is. This was um, a name that we just heard for the first time in this trial. I don't recall if she's mentioned in the grand jury transcript, Mm -hmm. but Melody James was uh, a witness that Detective Washington subpoenaed. She was extremely disappointed that she was being forced to come into court on redirect. John McKinney um, basically asked the detective questions where we learned that McKinney decided not to use her at all in the trial. Uh, We don't know why he, we don't know why she was subpoenaed or why detective McKinney changed his mind on using her as a witness, but no, we don't know who Melody James is at all. Wow. And that's pretty much um, that's pretty much on um, Detective Cedric Washington. Okay. Oh, one more thing is that on um, the defense attorney wanted to bring up that there were some serious safety concerns for some of the witnesses, and we learned that that Miss Nicholson, Bernita Mick- Nicholson, received a threat. Uh, about a day before she was scheduled to testify, a telephone call threat saying that you're the reason why Nipsey Hussle is dead. So she told the court that she feels a little nervous about coming to court. So they escorted her into the court building on the day she testified. And of course, they escorted her out for her safety. So that kind of that conversation between the attorneys came up and uh, the defense wanted to just show that witnesses are concerned and you know, this is a serious case about snitching and witnesses not wanting to be a part of this case. Even the star witness, Bernita Nicholson, was threatened by a phone call. According to Bernita, though, this is 
Bernita told the district attorney before she testified that she got this call and uh, they decided to give her extra security. Wait, is that really a threat? Because what, what exactly all they said was you're the reason why Nipsey is dead. That's more like harassment unless they unless they actually threaten her saying, hey, if you do this, blah, 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 you're going to be dead or or you're going to be hurt. Right. Yeah. Well, it, it depends on how you interpret that. Uh, even right. though a threat wasn't made in that statement. You could, you know, I don't think it's that, I don't think it's a reach to assume that that's kind of like a borderline threat. You know, you're the reason why Nipsey Hussle's dead if they did it in a, in a tone that wasn't joyful. <laughs> right, right, right. So um, we learned that after, during that phone call, she just hung up the phone. She didn't even respond to the person, and I think that was it. And then uh, that's the reason why they gave her, they escorted her into the courtroom and out, you know. Um, Whereas, for example, Cowboy, Cowboy's walking around the court free. You know, he goes to the cafeteria. You know, he goes up and down on the elevator. He doesn't – you could tell Cowboy doesn't have no feeling of of danger or concern or issue. You know, he's sitting there in the cafeteria having lunch. Doing push-ups. Well, he was doing push-ups in the hallway on the ninth floor. Right. Yeah. But um, I could understand Bernita's concern, though. But I do want to know – let the uh... – the people know the audience know that she isn't she isn't the person like she had nothing to do with it right yeah she she had nothing to do with the homicide she was completely unaware of what Eric Holder was going to do and if it's true that Eric Holder had that gun in his, or one of the guns in his pocket when he was at the Master Burger um, that means that he was able to hide the gun a lot of people don't realize you can get into someone's car with guns, with drugs, and they don't see it, you know? Right. I mean, how many times have someone come into your car with a backpack or a bag? I mean, we're not going to search our friends' backpacks, are we? <laughs> you know? So, we need to start hot- yeah, go ahead, I'm sorry. What were you going to say? We, sh- we should start doing that? <laughs> yeah, we might have to start doing that. We don't want to beat a, a, a Bernita, you know what I mean? We don't, we don't want to end up like her. No, but I, I know she's going to have to deal with this for, for many years to come. Yeah, you know? fortunately. So that was pretty much it. Um, we learned about the threat that Bernita received via the phone call. We learned about this witness named Melody James that never testified. And um, that's about it for Detective Washington. Mm-hmm. So after Detective Washington, they had scheduled the coroner named Lawrence Wynn, spelled N-G-U-Y-E-N. Mm-hmm. And before he testified, they excused the jury and they had a couple of questions that they wanted to ask the doctor outside the presence of the jury. And we learned during this short, this short uh, exchange that this doctor actually didn't do the autopsy on Nipsey Hussle, but he was going to testify about the autopsy using reports, Hmm. using um, CT scans, radiographs and other, other documents that he had. So for whatever reason, I guess the actual doctor that performed the autopsies is not available. I believe they pronounce his name as Dr. Fruit Futress. I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, but... Fruit Futress? Actual... Huh? Fruit Futress? Futress, I believe. That's what I heard. His, na- his name was mentioned once during, during testimony. And again, this was outside the presence of the jury. But uh, the coroner... And, um, well, basically, the two attorneys, they had some sort of uh, disagreement about the doctor that testifying. So Mm -hmm. they went into the judge's chambers. They had another meeting outside the presence of the outside the presence of the court. So the court reporter did go back there. So that that conversation is documented. It will be in the transcript. But we don't know what happened in that conversation. But whatever whatever happened when they came back out, maybe 15, 20 minutes later. They told the coroner to um, come back on Tuesday morning. Mm. So they uh, they decided not to have him testify on Thursday. And I remember hearing Prosecutor John McKinney say something, saying, we can't do this today. And then that's when they went and had a meeting with the judge outside the presence of the courtroom. So the, um, that ended his testimony. The jury never got to hear the coroner. And the- then they went on to the next witness, who was Michael Ramirez. 
Michael Ramirez is basically the paralegal for John McKinney in the Los Angeles District Attorney's Office. And he basically testified to his job was to pull up Eric Holder's rap sheet Mm -hmm. or arrest record or his criminal history. And basically, we just learned we learned some things, I guess, that we already knew. He was born on November 21st, 1989. Uh, He got arrested in Marina del Rey, which is a, a coastal community of the city of L.A. back on March 28th, 2012. Uh, he was charged with with possession of a firearm and possession of a controlled substance. He was charged with two counts, two separate counts. And then we find out that they dropped the, the drug count and he pled guilty to the gun case and received probation. And he, he, um, he pled guilty to carrying a loaded firearm in public. And um, his... His arrest record would be Exhibit 72 for any of those that are interested, and it's three pages. So he has a very short rap sheet. He just has that one arrest back in 2012, and he's got one felony conviction. I know that seems surprising to you because he's such a shooter. Well, I'm I'm not saying he's a shooter. I'm saying his reputation is one that he's a shooter. I know nothing about Eric Holder's gang pass other than what I've heard other people talk about. Right, right, right. Uh, and if and what he did to Nipsey Hussle, which we all know, um, there's no disputing what he did to Nipsey Hussle. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would seem to confirm that <laughs> the type of guy he is. I mean, if, if people are saying he's a shooter, and then you see what he did to Nipsey Hussle, um, it is surprising that this guy has only one arrest um, in 12 years of being an adult. Um, you know, he was 30 years old in 1989. I'm sorry, he was 30 years old in 2019 when he got arrested for this offense so to just see that he has this one offense one one arrest in 2012 it's a little surprising mm-hmm. and that pretty much wrapped up the 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 day six of testimony in the eric holder trial and everyone was ordered back into the courtroom on tuesday morning at 9 30. okay what do you say how, how long do you give it till, till this wraps up uh within the next week or so well, according to what the I, I asked the attorneys this after at the end of the day on Thursday, um, prosecutor McKinney says he's bringing back the coroner, and if he can get Rimpaw, he's only got two witnesses left, so he's going to wrap up on Tuesday morning, and if he get Rimpaw, then that might go a little bit into Tuesday afternoon. If it's just the cor- the coroner is only going to testify for like thirty minutes, right? There's- there's, there's probably going to be very little cross-examination by the defense regarding the coroner. Mm-hmm. So then the defense only has two witnesses. He's going to recall Cowboy, and he's going to bring uh, his own private gang expert to challenge some of the things that the gang cop said. Okay. So yeah. that's going to go into Tuesday afternoon, and both sides agreed that they would be doing closing arguments on Wednesday. So if we go by the time it took for opening statements, um, double that, double that. So we got an hour of opening statements from John McKinney. So you're going to get at least two hours of closing arguments from him. And I would say at least two hours of closing arguments from, from Jansen. And in the closing arguments, the prosecution gets to go one more time because the burden of proof is on the prosecution. So the court system gives them a last word. So it's the prosecution starts off with their, you know, two hour closing. The defense gets to um, follow up with his two hour closing and the prosecution gets to close it up with about maybe a 15, 20 minute final closing argument. And then the, the jury will start to deliberate. So I anticipate that the jury will probably have this case in their hands by Thursday. Wow. Yeah. It all depends if they get Rimpaw. If they get Rimpaw, you know, Rimpaw is going to be on the stand for for at least a couple hours if if they find him. Yeah. But if, but if they don't find him, I, I can see the the jury getting this case on on Thursday. So you know, if it's a quick deliberation, we might have a verdict Thursday. If not, Monday. 
Right. Now, you did uh, find out something, you know, not, not in trial, but you yourself asked the question to someone. And it, it was regarding the marathon store and the camera angle that we were all waiting for to see and has, has not, you know, came out whatsoever. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I asked the detective during one of the breaks in the hallway about um, the marathon camera as I I previously stated that most likely that camera was malfunctioning or didn't work or was a dummy camera because we've seen we've seen the uh, testimony from two cops whose job it was to go out there and find out all the surveillance cameras that were available and during the testimony of both those cops there was no mention of the marathon the marathon camera Right. So I had I decided to ask the detective um, what was the deal with the marathon camera, and basically, uh, he said the camera was functioning, the camera was working, the camera would probably show everything in detail, but they did not receive any cooperation from the owners of the marathon store to retrieve that video footage. So basically, the LAPD was unsuccessful in getting that footage from the owners of the marathon store. Wow. Now, what do you think that was? Well, I mean, how come that, like, <laughs> you would think that the, the cops would be would do a better job to see, I don't know, season that footage or, you know, because it, it is, it would be the most important and closest angle to what went down, no? Well, I mean, the cops did everything they could do to get it. You got to remember that whoever, whoever we're saying is the owner of the Marathon store, they had a head start to disconnect the DVR and to take it to another location. So by the time the cops did come and investigate, which would have been the very next day, um, there was no cooperation. And you can't force you can't force them to turn over the footage, but you can you could you could subpoena the footage. Right. But if they took the footage to another place, then you can't subpoena something if you don't know where it's at. They could pull it from the sky, like your boy said. I don't know who that was. <laughs> guy at Clubhouse. I don't know. I'm, yeah, I don't. I don't know. And, and it, you know, there's a process to getting that footage, just like the way they got the footage from the Fat Burger. I'm sorry, not the Fat Burger, Master Burger. Um, there's a process. You know, you mm -hmm. got to get the. You, you first, you got to get permission from Master Burger, and then you have to get access to the DVR. Then the law enforcement has to bring their equipment in so they can get the information from the DVR to a flash drive or a hard drive. So there, it requires a certain level of cooperation on the part of the owners of the footage. Right. You can't bust your way in the door and be like, you give me this fucking footage or, you know, it's still, it's still no. America, All right. I mean, in 2019, and, and I would say for the past, you know, couple decades, um, you know, the LAPD does have a bad reputation of practices and procedures that have been very hurtful to the community. But in most instances, they're not busting in, stealing DVRs, you know. Right. They just can't bust in and steal a DVR, you know. Um, there's, a, there's a process. And Master Burger cooperated. And Shell Gas Station, they cooperated. In fact, the Shell Gas Station gave that footage up to TMZ before the LAPD got the footage. Mm. Right. Ain't that something? Yeah. So uh, here's – and it also makes me think – if TMZ got that Shell gas station, gas station footage before the LAPD even got it, that means they attempted to get the, the footage from the Marathon store. Right. And they were unsuccessful. Well, that, that'd, be, that'd be an interesting play out, though. Like, who I, – I just – because when I think of TMZ, I have to think about some freaking white guy walking into the Marathon store. Hey, can I get your footage of uh, this Nipsey shooting? And, like, and they'd be like, what the fuck are you talking about, man? What, get the, you know what I mean? Like – this well, just went down. No, the way the way TMZ does it is they offer money right off the right. jump. They were also the first ones to have the footage at the Tams Burger Place when Suge Knight ran over Terry Carter and Bone. Yeah. TMZ had that footage before the LAPD had the footage. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm sure TMZ bought the footage from the Shell gas station and put it out like immediately. I'm sure they went to the marathon store and offered whatever they whatever they offered to show. Actually, they probably offered more right. to the marathon store because that's a better and closer angle. Yeah. You would think a worker or somebody would have a copy or an access to it, you know? 
Well, I'm sure that that footage is still existing somewhere because you're. I would think that one day they want to do a a movie about Nip, a documentary about Nip, and they could actually say in their film, "We have never be seen, never before seen footage of what happened in that parking lot." Right. You know. So, I mean, if they would have gave it to the police, it would be that footage would become old quickly. Right. And who is the owner of the marathon store? I don't know. Um, some people are saying that. Oh, I can tell you that that uh, Cowboy said that his boss was Black Sam. Right. He said that he didn't work for Nipsey Hussle. He worked for Black Sam. So I'm just I'm making an assumption that uh, I don't know if there's co-owners, if there's a sole owner, but definitely Black Sam is uh, was Cowboy's boss. All right. Let Let's say let, Let's assume this. Let's assume it, it, it is Black Sam. And it could be that case, yeah. We could think we could have it for they could have it for a documentary or whatever. But at the same time, me, what I think, I mean, it would be tough to have if I was like you know if that was my brother that you know to have uh, some footage like that existing and have it out there. Who knows? That probably it, he, Black Sam could have just destroyed that footage, don't you think? Because that would have been if yet if that was out there, that would have been the the image of his brother's killing, you know. Um, that's a great point because that footage is probably more graphic right. than the show gas station footage. And maybe he doesn't want the world to see his brother going out like that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's already graphic in the grainy footage. Exactly. You know, you see, you see Nip falling down backwards and you see him with his hands, yeah. you know, begging for his life in, in essence. Um, I would have, you know, if, if let's assume that it is black Sam that did it. I would have did the same thing that Black Sam did. Right. I would have. I would have said, um, "I don't have the footage. The footage is gone." I. I would have not had. I, I would want control of how these images about my brother dying, going out to the world. Right. And they can preserve that footage to tell the Nipsey Hustle story the way they want to tell it, with never before seen images of his last moments if they want to do that rather than it being turned over to the state of California as evidence in a homicide trial. Right, right, right. And they, and it's not like the LAPD does not have enough evidence to convict Perfect. Eric Holder on this case. It, whether or not it's first degree or manslaughter, it doesn't matter what video angle we're looking at. You know, it's mm -hmm. the decision about first degree and manslaughter, which is what this whole trial is about. It has nothing to do about the camera angle. It has to do about this conversation right. that occurred between Eric Holder and Nipsey Hussle. Right. And it could be very well the, the streets, you know, people, you know, from that neighborhood, from that from a certain lifestyle. They don't talk to police. They don't help them out. They don't, you know what I mean? Like that, that could be very well the case, no? That's part of it as, as well. Um, you know. Some people are just not comfortable with cooperating with the police. Right. They figure they figure, look, you guys already have check this out. Um in terms of witnesses in this case, Michael Ramirez, who was the paralegal, is the nineteenth witness that has testified for the prosecution. Mm -hmm. So they, they have enough witnesses to draw to draw out this story, right. to tell the story of what happened, and they really don't they don't really need that footage, but I'm, I know that the public wants to see that footage. Right. I understand that. The public wants to see that. But that's us being selfish and nosy. Right. If Black Sam does not want that footage to be seen, I feel like we need to respect that. That's his brother being slain on HD footage. Right. And, and once you turn that footage over to the LAPD, you have no control over it anymore. And then it becomes a public record after right. the trial's over you know right. and guess how many youtube videos are going to post it and do their analysis and, and their examination of it if you're the brother do you want all these people doing that absolutely not yeah so i really can't blame black sam if it is black sam for not cooperating and turning that footage over right i remember that that was one of the first things people had said when the, when that shit went down was just People were so nosy, and they think they have the right to 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 to, to everything. All oh, this cameras everywhere. This is 2019. 
What about the camera right above the Marathon store? You can see it clearly on Google Maps. Uh, where's that footage? Yeah, it, it, something fishy's going on. We don't, we can't see that footage. Is the police involved? Blah blah blah. I'm like, you, just just because you fucking on the internet 24 seven doesn't give you the right your to 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 see everybody's private property and or, or whatever you know or killing of this and that. I'm like, get the fuck out of here. What are you doing? Yeah, I mean, I know everyone's appetite is yeah, they want to see it, but. Think about it from the other way, from from another perspective. If your mother or your father or your brother or sister is gunned down, getting shot at least 10 or 11 times, um, do you want that footage out there for the world to see? And, oh, and not only that, I, I believe one day that footage will be out there for us to see, but it's going to be delivered to us the way they want it delivered. Right. So. Once it be once it gets turned over, you lose control over it. So there's two issues here: losing control of the footage because now it becomes a, a public record in a court case, mm -hmm. and then two, they're not ready for the world to see this footage because they're still mourning. It's only been three years, right? And I can just tell you, um, for some people, you're gonna mourn for the rest of your life. You know, right. um, I don't I don't know what it's like to lose a brother, but I can imagine that three years later you're still mourning and do you want that do you want to have a lack of control of that footage to where it's going to be posted up all over the place absolutely not so so for all you guys out there that think something crazy is going on nothing crazy is going on um i was surprised to find out that the footage does exist the footage the camera was working but let's think about it he did not want to turn it over he did okay. not want to cooperate with the investigation. And Black Sam has showed up zero times in this trial. Right. So I don't think any of us should um, judge him for that or be be overly critical that he did not turn this, this footage over to the police. Yeah. And, yeah, well, we could go on and on about this, but, yeah. No doubt, no doubt. All right, well, well appreciate your um, – your, your input um any any last words you want to leave the people with um if, if you're in the los angeles area and you're really interested in this trial and you have some questions about what's going on in this courtroom it is open to the public the next court date and, and this court is, is is winding down it's almost coming to the end but there's still a couple of exciting more days to come so tuesday morning 9 30 a.m department 104 on the ninth floor you're welcome to come sit in and and check it out for yourself. Um, it, my experience is that everyone has been completely transparent. The prosecutor will sit there and talk with you if you have any questions. The defense attorney will do the same. Uh, and the detective, Detective Cedric Washington, this guy is there every single day. If you got a question, if you got a concern, um, he will most likely have an answer to any of your questions. Any question that I've had, it was answered. And it was answered to, to my satisfaction. Mm -hmm. So I just want to invite the public, especially if you're in L.A., come down and check it out. I'm I'm a little disappointed that that as much as Nipsey Hussle was loved and as and as and important as an icon in Los Angeles that he was, that there's not more fans there. There's not more people in the in the back row just you know watching the process. Yeah, you would think. Yeah. So I'll end it on that. Yeah, there it is. 